Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. And I'll just turn that off because we've got a bit of an echo. Um, this is going to, um, in fact, if we do that, if we do that, sorry, sorry about that. Um, this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania, and uh, with our ATV night. And I welcome back into the state. Mr. Rex Moncur, VK7MO. Welcome, Rex. Thank you, Justice. Now, Rex has uh, some very interesting uh, information to uh, uh, give us tonight about his trip to the... The USA and also to MUD. Now, MUD sounds a bit odd, <laughs> but it actually stands for Microwave Update. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> which is sort of like an American Gips Tech. Uh, right. Okay. Which Runs oh. for three days. Okay. I'll tell you a bit about my trip first. Okay. Um, started off flying to San Francisco and then took the train to Salt Lake City. Now, for someone like me who's travelled around Salt Lakes in South Australia... <laughs> a bit different? Well, they're all roughly at sea level, aren't they? Correct. In fact, Lake is below sea level. Uh, yes. Salt Lake City has salt lakes which are higher than Mount Wellington. You kidding me? I am not. <laughs> in the mountains, in the because that's that salt lake. Salt Lake City is surrounded by that higher, even higher even mountains. Higher mountains. Okay. Uh, and that that was a big surprise to me. Okay. Uh, it, salt Lake City is at four thousand feet, which is higher than Mount Wellington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's in a valley. Uh, with these salt lakes, two big salt lakes, but then it's got two big mountain ranges, which is where people do uh, optical, optical <laughs> and microwave because oh, okay. it's okay. so high up, the air density is lower, the water vapor is dry, dry, and, oh, yeah. and, and so, okay. Okay. It, so that was a surprise, and in fact. Before mud, I I visited, I think five or six of the iconic national parks and travelled about oh, 2,000 miles 
and didn't get below the height of Mount Wellington once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, it's OK. Which was all a surprise to me. <laughs> didn't think so much of America was so high. <laughs> That's right. OK. Yeah, and the highest I got was 9,600 feet just driving on the highway. Wow. OK. <laughs> and the mountains were up... Because <laughs> they, they went through a saddle. <laughs> yeah, OK. 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 Well, well, we'll start with a little okay. overview of the trip to the national parks. OK. Um, just bear with me, um, because I'll... Uh, PC, we need to do... Uh, oh, we need to do that. OK. <laughs> that was a bit we of a... We started run. off at... Yellowstone National Park and this is where uh, there's all sorts of steam coming out of the ground. Oh, that's a bit bigger. And uh, you can walk all on sort of boardwalks all through this area. They say don't don't put your hand in the water. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. Next slide. Now wow. in another part of Yellowstone the the hot water sort of bubbles up through the limestone and then sets up all these little pretty patterns. Dams. Little dams. Little yeah. dams. Yep. It, you know, a bit like the rice paddy fields in Indonesia. Yep. Uh, I mean, a much smaller scale. But, you know, brilliant whites and different colours. and all. You, you actually see this in a number of limestone caves as well. Do, Very similar. Do you? Very okay. similar. Well, so. I was... N- next slide. Uh, now, this is what's called Prismatic Lake. And, you know, it's just all the, the rainbow colours. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Roy, Roy G. Biff. <laughs> and, and what causes it is the temperature of the lake is hottest in the middle. Yeah. And different bacteria grow in a different temperature regime. Okay. And they're of different colours. Wow. Okay. And, and you can see the people at the back. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a big lake, <laughs> and and it comes out like. So, so, what sort of temperature are you talking about in the in like in the middle of the lake? Uh, um, I don't know what it was, but steam was pouring off. Yeah, it. okay, okay. Uh, in fact, that was the problem. To the wind would blow the steam away, and then a gust would so you could take a photo, and then you had steam okay. in the way. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess you get water vapor. It looks like steam before it's actually steaming hot. And yeah. if it was steaming hot, it'd be bubbling and it's in the middle, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, boiling. Yeah. Yep. So I don't think it was that hot, but still, you wouldn't want to wouldn't want to put your hand in it. Yeah. Well, I didn't. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. Okay. Next slide. This is uh, one of the geysers. The the one that the it's uh, called Old Faithful, um, and uh, it, it comes about every 50 minutes and you sit around plus or minus 10 minutes waiting for it to, <laughs> to go okay and that that was pretty specky uh, Ooh, okay. some of the wildlife uh, the herd of bison uh, who have learnt that humans are not a problem <laughs> okay <laughs> and, uh, you sort of drive around and when you see a bunch of cars you know there'll be some life wildlife right. that they're all trying to photograph <laughs> okay okay Next slide. Uh, nice waterfalls in the Yellowstone Park. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of water. Yes. And, uh, and this is at the end of their summer. So, yeah. Imagine what it's like in winter. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, maybe it all freezes in winter. Oh, yeah, actually, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I did see a, a moose. <laughs> oh, is that a moose? Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, finding the wildlife is a matter of finding a group of cars. Yes, okay, okay. <laughs> Next slide. Oh. A, a little chipmunk. <laughs> okay. Very tame. Okay. Next slide. This is a, another of their national parks called Grand Teton. Uh, and there's some really lovely uh, mountains uh, that come down to lakes. Wow. Uh, and uh, So what sort of height are we talking here, where, where you are, uh, versus what we're looking at? I, I guess 5,000 f- or 6,000 feet up to 14,000 feet. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> right. That's one hell of a summit. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Now this is down to the Grand Canyon. Okay. Um, the the Grand Canyon's not as spectacular because it is so big that you can't take it all in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but that's sort of what it looks like. Fantastic yeah. geology there. Yes, I, I, I kept thinking of uh, <laughs> Pat Quilty and John Lovering when I was going around. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a shot of the Grand Canyon in the back through a hole in the... Oh, okay. In the a little bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little yeah, bridge yeah, in yeah. a mountain. Yeah. This is another national park called Zion National Park where at least you can go down to the bottom. I mean, you, in theory, you can go down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but it's about two days... Trek in. Trek in and yeah. out. Okay. So I wasn't okay. going to do that. Uh, now, Z Zion... Am I right? Zion was the first national park? No. No, Yellowstone was the first. Yellowstone, And okay. that goes back to about 1870 or something okay. like that. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Cool. Uh, and there's a little grey squirrel. Oh, yes, okay. Next. <laughs> and I'd never heard of these. These are Native American sheep. Sheep? Yes. Look like a goat. Uh, it's called a longhorn sheep. <laughs> oh, okay, righto. Uh, they don't shear them, do they? They don't. I, they, they don't. I didn't ask that question. But no, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now, Ooh. this is another national park called Bryce National Park, and you can see the geology is completely different yep. to the other ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. it, it's, it's, uh, all of these, this whole area, and, and it's probably oh, no, a thousand miles from north to south. Yep has all been uplifted up yep. and it was all and then weathered away all at the bottom of the sea and, and uplifted four or five thousand feet <laughs> yep yep uh, you probably find sea, sea sea fossils in that those yes, those cliffs but yeah anyway next slide oh now, wow now th this is the sort of thing that is at bryce national park <laughs> it's just amazing stuff <laughs> Wacko. That's amazing. Yeah. Is that now? Is that sandstone? Are we, are we talking uh, sandstone? Limestone. Limestone. Okay. Limestone. Okay. Okay. Uh, with the red means there's a bit of iron in iron it. Oxide. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you can see grey bits on the top. Okay. And that means magnesia got involved with the limestone, and yep. that was more difficult to. Um, to, to erode, weather, weather yep. so that you get the, the grey tops on these. Aragonite. Yes. Mm. Now, what do they call these things? I've forgotten what they call. But it looks like a little, like a Lilliput, Lilliput village. <laughs> anyway, if, you, if you've been to um, uh, Kings Canyon in the uh, um, Northern Territory, very similar. <laughs> so. Okay. okay. We well, have been to Kings Canyon, but no, no, didn't. But they had Lili Lilliput Village is a little a little version of what. what oh, you okay. see. Sorry. Uh, I, I should say, this whole thing goes for thirty miles. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah. Huge. <laughs> Huge. Uh, and they've got a, a road and little pull-offs where you can see different things. Okay. And there's another part of it. Okay. Now, this is an, another national park called Archers National Park. Now, this is natural. That's eroded. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> like that. Yep. <laughs> uh, what I... Th next slide. Now, what, what's happening here is these arches, and there's dozens of them, yep. have all eroded naturally. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, and... Uh, you have to do a fair bit of walking, so I only got a couple, but... Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, next flight. Now, this one's amazing. Ooh, yes. Look, look, that's about 30 metres across and about 10 metres high, and it looks like it's only about one or two metres thick, and yet it's staying up. Wow. <laughs> made out of limestone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, okay. And there's another shot of it. it shows you just how thin it is. Thin it is. My goodness. Uh, this is another national park called Canyonlands. Uh, dear, dear. Now, oh. uh, after the conference, I went out and visited LW5LUA. Uh, 
and this this is L uh, in his shack. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. And uh, we'll just go through a couple of his things. Now, this is some of his high microwave stuff, like 47, 77, and 120 gigs. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide. Look! Look at the waveguide. Oh yes. Stuff. Uh, it's uh, all plumbing. Uh, 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 <laughs> next slide. Uh, yeah, that's a sort of cassegrain oh, fe feed on some band. Yeah. And, and all stuff it behind it. Next slide. And there's some more. Now, you'll notice the dish is pointing upwards. Yep, okay. And what L does is he points this up at a fly swatter okay. antenna. Yep. A passive reflector. Passive reflector. Uh, and uh, it can work 47 and 77 gigs from... And, and this can be basically on the ground. No, oh. it can't. Oh, no, sorry. On on, well, on the base of the tower. Yes, so that it rotates yeah. as the tower rotates. Okay, okay. So, so, okay. You, so the, the whole thing's in sync. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I had never thought of, but... I think that's probably important. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Next slide. Here's his test equipment. <laughs> wow, yeah, okay. Not insignificant. <laughs> uh, next slide. Now, he does, I don't think he uses this now, but this is how you can generate really high power at uh, sort of 2.3 gigs. Okay, okay. This is a Klystron. You're uh, kidding me. I am not. And uh, before there was solid state devices that could produce high power, yep. like, so which has only been in the last 10 or 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To get, uh, to do EME, this is a great big magnet around the bloody thing and okay yeah 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 <laughs> and it's a valve it's a big it's a big valve uh, yeah and uh, lots of current lots of voltage lots of voltage and I, I don't know how much power it can produce but i think he's kept it there for posterity right. <laughs> okay okay all right uh some more of his really high frequency stuff now this is uh, is ten gig five meter EME dish. <laughs> you are kidding me. Uh, I should say it's slightly exaggerated in the horizontal dimension. I think the way we <laughs> yeah okay it's the scaling on here. The scaling. Yep. Uh, Alice not as fat. And <laughs> as that implies. So, so, sorry to our. <laughs> sorry yes. to our. Uh, but it does give you an idea of. <laughs> Five metres. And he, that's fully steerable, I assume. Fully that's steerable, yes. Uh, he does point out, he pointed out that because of the legs on the tripod, if uh, in certain directions yep. the dish can't go below a certain yep. elevation. Okay. Uh, and that's why sometimes he can't get below about and he's 20. got a house in the way here so i don't think it fouls the house but but uh it's it's the tripod itself yeah okay well a, a, a quad pod yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> now this is 24 gig which is a 2.4 i think uh okay uh made a dish 24 gigs my yeah goodness. and uh and that's a that's a polar mount, is it? Is it, or is that a fully uh, no, steerable? That's that's a fully steerable. Uh, again, he's got the problem that he can't beam close to the horizon because the the the. the oh, it's an offset. It's, it's an offset. It's dish. an offset for the dish. It's okay. A, uh, and when you bring that to, to the horizon, the uh, feed uh, gets into the dirt. Uh, well and truly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I thought this was pretty interesting. This is all the cables that are coming out of his house to go to his antenna. Oh, my God. And that, most of that looks like Heliax. Uh, yes. Uh, the, there's 
there's sort of two and a half inch heliax and um, probably three quarter inch heliax. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, that covers the That's talk, it. and okay. now Oops. I'll tell you a little bit about mud. Uh, first, this is, if we can put that uh, on yep. there. Uh, just bear with me because we need to go to there. In case anyone wasn't listening, MUD stands for Microwave Update. <laughs> not not yes. much. <laughs> yes. So this is the Proceedings of Microwave Update 2019. Now, and we're not talking about an insignificant document. I think it's 446 pages. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> and they had this produced and available when you registered. Yep. Okay. Uh, unlike Gipstech, where you don't get it for, for um, and well until the next. Um, although I, last Gipstech, Peter was asking whether people wanted a, a, an actual hard copy at the at, at, yeah, which meant yeah. putting pressure on everybody to produce their papers. Correct beforehand. The, beforehand. But that's uh, that's obviously what happens here. Yes. Um, now th this isn't. This is. Is this everything that was presented? Plus, plus, or plus. plus. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I would say about half the papers were present that are in here were presented. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, I presented two papers, but I put four in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I know there was a G guy put in about oh, about eight papers and didn't present at all, didn't come over. So. But yeah, they're okay. all in the book, are they? The, but they're all in the book. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, th this, I, I mean, the ARRL actually... Publish it. Publish yeah. it. The publishing company, the ARRL. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but People but think they're an amateur radio club. But <laughs> the whole thing's really well organised and Al is the guy that made it all So happen. Al's the convener. He's he was the, the convener the and uh, he's a very relaxed sort of guy. Okay. And, uh, Which is good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think he did a terrific job with the way he put it together. They they don't hold it at the same place each year. Okay. Uh, like Gipstex always mm. in what, the same place. Yep. Uh, it may not be, but in future, but yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know something that I don't know? I know, just some comments of, from Peter, so uh, it may, may not be held at the, the university, so. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I thought they did a really good job. Mm. Uh, I'll, the, the format of it was on the first, it's three days altogether. Mm. That's oh, 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 and the, the the third day is the Saturday, which gives everyone the Sunday to get home because okay. people are flying flying out all around the states. Yep. Uh, so the format was the um, the first day in the morning they had what they called a surplus tour. Uh, I, I won't put that there, but there was a list of places that you could go to. Quite an extensive list actually. Um, we're talking about uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, probably 15 places. That's right. So, uh, uh, And like some of them are Texas Towers and you know commercial radio places. Uh, but uh, Anything of interest like like sort of the jungle? Uh, Look, I, I went round with Paul Wade. You, you yep. can't get to them all. Uh, and he picked out a few. Uh, the uh, One of them was Ham Radio Outlet. So <laughs> <laughs> so one of the biggest retailers <laughs> of Ham Radio <laughs> gear in America. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, Paul didn't take me there, but, you know, there's no point in going to a place that just sells you an icon, is it? Correct, correct, correct. correct. Uh, the, um, <laughs> yeah. And I'll just point out there is a community recycling place. So metal recycling but often scrap PCB boards and worrying. So yes. there you go. So, so they, they have 
<laughs> resource yeah. tip shops there too. Right. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we went to three places. The first was uh, a surplus shop which basically seemed to buy up, I would have thought, modern stuff that, say, an electronics company had made too many and had lots of parts left over and yep. stuff. Okay. Uh, not not the sort of surplus of my youth going to Waltham Dan or um, or, Ro- or Robbie's in Adelaide, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with, and and stuff like that. Uh, I I still think you could get everything on the internet that you'd want, but but it was interesting to go round, um, okay. and uh, that was that. In the afternoon, they ran a. So that was the Friday morning. The Thursday morning. Thursday morning. morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then okay. in the afternoon they ran a GNU radio workshop. Which so no, that's all right. We'll just hold it up. Um, GNU radio, which is um, which is very popular, um, modular toolkit for uh, radio. Um, so, um, and in fact, I've ordered one, please. Okay. <laughs> so, just just before I walked into your place, and it's sitting there on the desk, and so I went, Ooh. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I so, you, uh, you actually did the workshop? I did the workshop. Okay. Um, What's your thoughts? I, I could keep up with the first half of it, but <laughs> okay. after that... Okay. Uh, I think they were going a bit fast for most of us. Okay. But there, there, there were two or three people kept up with them all the time. Okay. And how, how many were in the workshop? Just... Uh, probably 60. 60 people. Yeah. All with their notebooks? Yes. All with their yeah, yes. You, you, it basically, the, I didn't bring it, but you, you've got a thumb drive yeah. that, that, yep. that they provided for the conference, which had everything that's in the proceedings, everything that's in this, as well as the slides for everyone's presentations and a, a, a listing of everything on the web that someone found that's of if interest to microwaves. Wow. Okay. Uh, I didn't bring it along. But no, 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 I'm no. Sure but, that but that's that's excellent. That is yeah. fantastic. Yes. So then uh, on the Friday we went into the conference proper. Okay. Probably I'll just run through a few of these yep. things. Uh, Friday morning was a, an exercise in, uh, they had some very expensive noise figure testing equipment and people brought along their preamplifiers for bands Kick, kicker. between 1296 and oh, 47 gigs. Okay and got their preamplifiers all tested. They'd set up a uh, an antenna test range, so people brought their dishes along and... Okay. Uh, a bit like what we're going to be doing tomorrow and Sunday. I'm not sure what we're doing tomorrow, oh, okay. but okay. we will see what okay. happens with tomorrow. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, then uh, at... Uh, at lunch, we, we had lunch, and they basically had lunch at the tables where you sat down for the conference. Okay. So, actually, you, you sat down behind tables, so you could write and, okay. and do things. Uh, and while we were having lunch, a guy gave a, a talk on rain scatter. Um, okay. Then, after lunch, a guy gave a talk on... <laughs> Adventures with uh, 630 to 850 nanometers. He's, he's just discovered something new called cloud bounce with light, and he's got <laughs> 20 <laughs> kilometers using it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, so you asked a question in that one, I understand. Yeah. Now, someone else asked a question. Uh, uh, he said to the guy, uh, do you uh, do you use silicon APDs, avalanche photodiodes? And uh, the guy had obviously never heard of them. And I was mean enough to put my hand up and say, 
Yes, we be using them in VK and we've got 286 kilometres using one. <laughs> cloud bounce. <laughs> With cloud <laughs> bounce. Well, that was a showstopper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and everyone went uh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I then gave my talk on small dish portable EME, uh, which I thought went down pretty well. Okay. Uh, a guy gave a talk on uh, high power LDMOS devices, um, which you know these days for Americans you can you can get a kilowatt in a in a block <laughs> that's not that much bigger than a cigarette packet for for, <laughs> for both um, twelve ninety six and two point three gigs uh, using these devices that are virtually indestructible. Yeah. So. Uh, a guy gave a talk on using WF28 waveguide at 47 gigs because it's readily available on all of the stuff that really should work at 47 gigs has been Snapped up. stepped up by the hams. So okay. I wasn't that impressed of, from what he said. Uh, I think it's a fudge thing which doesn't work as well, but <laughs> particularly okay. if the waveguide's bent. Uh, someone gave a talk on using um, TV LNVs on 10 gigs. Yep. Uh, so uh, sat satellite LNVs. Yes, yeah, yeah. for receiving. Yep. Um, I mean, it, you're still well behind uh, a DB6 NT. Yep. Yeah. Someone on roving on microwaves. Rambo ro roving. Yeah, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> Uh, then they had a flea market uh, after dinner, and that was pretty good. Okay. Um, there were probably three rooms, large rooms set aside for the flea market, okay. and uh, I, I mean I couldn't carry much back with me, so I didn't. I got a few little hmm. connectors and things, but yeah. okay. but no, their flea markets much better than as what used to be pretty good when Alan used to do it in yeah. Gips Tech but yep. uh, their flea markers are good okay the next day uh, WA5 VJB Kent Britain gave a talk on advanced Yagi techniques uh, now it, it was a sort of a an amusing talk but he was trying to poo-poo a lot of the ham uh, myths, myths. Yeah. Uh, okay. like people who design Yagis with four decimal points. <laughs> uh, and uh, I challenge anyone to get that accuracy when you're cutting them. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. But one sort of one point he made, which I've actually heard seen before on the web, but I, I think it's worth repeating is most people think that if you've got a say a 2 meter Yagi and a 432 meg Yagi above it yep. you work out the capture area of the 432 meg Yagi and the capture area of the 2 meter Yagi and you make sure the capture areas don't overlap yep. but it's not true you've got to work out what is the capture area at the frequency that you're using and a 2 meter Yagi's probably got almost no capture area at 432 uh, and, vice versa. and vice versa so you can actually put them very close together mm. and that saves you a lot of and, and in fact if you take Glenn's talk at Gibbs Tech a few years ago you actually put them in reverse yeah uh, if you're up on a, a, a suitable cliff or something um, with a great takeoff you actually the tradition is 72 6 you actually reverse them and put six Two and seventy <laughs> in the reverse direction. Yeah, exactly what I do. So, and the people run into problems when they've got a HF Yagi because the capture area is really big. If it's a big Yagi, yeah, yeah, but but that doesn't matter because it won't have any capture area. At VH. Two or seven yeah, or yeah. six. But if they're stacking HF Yagi, oh, if stacking them on, the, if you're using stacking, that's right. Yeah. You, you've got to have a big stacking difference. Yeah. But but stacking multi-band. Yeah, yeah, then you're you, okay. That and 
he'd done some tests where he showed that he put a 432 meg Yagi as close as he could get it to a two metre Yagi, yep. and it only cost half a dB. Yeah, okay. And it was about this far apart. Yep. Uh, there you go. He did point out you've got to be a bit careful about coupling between the two driven elements such that your preamp on 432 doesn't get a lot of energy. Yeah. Okay. And, and he suggests you, you make sure that you don't fit the driven elements exactly right. above each other, so you don't burn your preamp. Yep. But uh, okay. I thought uh, it wasn't really microwaves, but I thought that was. Hmm. Well, and, and Kent Britton's um, he, he writes some good stuff. He, he he's yeah, yeah, a bit of a legend in his lunchbox. So um, making up waveguide to coax transitions. Um, Microwave millimetre bands and the regulatory challenges ahead. They've got some dreadful challenges in the United States uh, in terms of the pressure that's being put on their microwave bands. And one of them is they've been limited to 300 watts EIRP on 77. EIRP? Gig. You've got to be kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> now, yeah, okay. at 77 gigs, you'd normally have an antenna which has got 40 dB again, so that means you can only use 100 milliwatts or something. Correct, input. <laughs> yeah, or less. Uh, That's all right. And, <laughs> and, and the pressure on all of their microwave bands. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And this is 5G pressure, I assume, and yes. a lot of other things. Yes, yeah. okay. yes, 5G pressure. Uh, guy gave a talk on uh, his 6 metre feed. Uh, 6 centimetre. 6 centimetre feeds, yeah. yes. Did I say 6 metre? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's uh, a big dish. <laughs> yes. Uh, Fairly heavy talk on impedance matching techniques, which I didn't follow. Okay. Uh, but obviously a very professional guy who does it at work. Okay, um, okay. Uh, I gave a talk on 10 and 24 gig terrestrial, which I think they enjoyed. Cool. Uh, oh, Paul. Well, uh, over lunch, uh, there was a talk by, again, you're sitting down, you go to the back, you grab your plate, you fill it up, and then there's somebody talking over lunch. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, this was all about them doing their millimetre wave stuff in these high mountains Okay. in, in the States, uh, with low absorption and low moisture. and and stuff, um, stuff we, there's no way we can repeat it. Uh, Paul Wade on uh, wave making up waveguide uh, directional couplers. A guy talking about Arduino controllers. Okay. Uh, case studies by a uh, National Weather Service meteorologist, which I was looking forward to. Um, I don't think uh, he really went into the depths that I was hoping, but okay. uh, I, 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 you know, I, I think we're learning a lot about propagation of high-level ducts and things like that. And, uh, he uh, he didn't seem to be aware of the way we derive ducts from the um, University of Wyoming data and stuff like that. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, practical applications of the Lime SDR. Yep. He basically, I think, c concluded that the Lime SDR is actually not all that useful, but <laughs> he put a lot of effort into it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Texas Instruments synthesizer for local oscillators. Um, if you're building something from scratch, probably interesting. Okay. Uh, and uh, dual feed antennas for X and X band. Uh, the guy who actually gave this talk, when they read out his record, he, he's 
been an antenna specialist par excellence because he designed all the things for Minuteman rockets and all sorts of things. Okay. Uh, but uh, what, what, it, it was a fairly simple antenna that he was talking about, f f a combined thing for use with the Hale satellite thing okay. and a common dish, okay. which unfortunately we can't see in Australia. Uh, no, don't have any view of it. Uh, and then they had their banquet where I was invited to be the invited speaker uh, cool. and told to uh, talk about all of the beautiful things I'd seen travelling around Australia and after I'd just been all through all their national parks. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> However, they seem to be entertained by the federal police. And so <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Good stuff. Uh, then, after it, they they have something similar to Gips Tech, but uh, the dinner, by the way, is very well done. And then they uh, they have prize giving, but everybody gets a prize. Uh, it's just the order, and so they've got all these prizes on a table up the front. And if your ticket gets pulled out, you get first pick. Okay. And I got a little bag of uh, probably half a dozen adapters and stuff so okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, they were quite good prizes mm. okay. uh, I, I guess my impression was very well organised, very smooth yeah. uh, standard of talks probably about the same as Gips Tech, I was a bit surprised given that you know there's probably a hundred times more hams in these so how many how many people all, all up went, went to the went to the conference? Uh, one hundred and ten, I think. That's so about, about the same. About the same as Gibbs Tech. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. Admittedly, it's focused on microwave. Yep. Although they seem to talk about some VHF things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they do have a number of other VHF conferences that okay. probably take away some of the numbers. Yep. Uh, but my impression is Gibbs Tech does pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this is, this is annual. This is this is an this, annual. This, event. this is annual, and they rotate it to different areas around, okay. around the states. Oh, that's fantastic, Rex. Yeah. Really so. good. Okay. And thank you for sharing your um your uh, your holiday pics of the 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 um national parks in the, the very impressive national parks. <laughs> they are in the U.S. So um, wow, that's 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 incredible. Okay, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, what we what we've got next? Oh well, you you went to this as well, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we um, I'll just uh, do a bit of setup here um, because um, last um, last week uh, last week we went to um, we went to the Lion Drink and Milk Factory. To uh, have a bit of a oh, there's you. Um, <laughs> have a look, a bit of a look at. Um, um, oh, and it's not on here. No, we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to do that another <laughs> night. Oh, dear, oh dear. Um, I thought I'd put it on there, but anyway, no, we'll go on to the next one. <laughs> um, um, so we'll, we'll hold that over until next week because we've got one more. Um, DOTV night until we've got our next um, our next uh, event, our next presentation night, which is um, I'll do a bit of a plug for uh, Dr. Con O'Neill from uh, GP um, um, General Practice Plus. General Practice Plus, that's it, in Cascade Road. <laughs> Sorry, just down the road from me. I should know what it is. Um, and Dr. Con O'Neill's actually given us a uh, agreed to give us a talk on men's health. So. Uh, uh, he'll be coming along on the 6th of November, so it's the first, we're back to the first Wednesday night. <laughs> so um, so we're back to uh, the first Wednesday night for our presentation night. So that's from 7.30pm, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Con O'Neill coming along to talk about men's health. So well worth, um, well worth a, bit, a bit of a reminder about uh, the things that ail, uh, ail men. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hopefully the ways that you can uh, you can reduce the risk and and prevent them from uh, from causing problems. So now the next thing is um, just here. Um, this is um, <laughs> a dangerous implement. 
<laughs> well, some were saying, oh, it's a, it's a new design of an antenna um, of some sort. A fly swatter antenna. A fly swatter <laughs> antenna. <laughs> no, mashed potatoes. Ma for, and, and has a sideline of a mashing potatoes. Yeah. Now, those people who have been... Um, <laughs> <laughs> who have been following us for a little while, and I'll, I'll, I won't say for how long, but for a little while, <laughs> um, uh, will know the significance of this particular device. <laughs> Th this particular device, um, I broke. Um, one of the, um, a couple of the spot welds um, broke on this particular device whilst I was using it. And um, in my usual uh, fashion, I was reticent to throw it away because I thought, I can fix this. So over the next X number of weeks, months, um, <laughs> I, I have been... In the um, meantime, you bought another one. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I resisted. I resisted. He's been missing mashed potatoes for a while. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do admit I used a fork for a <laughs> year. <laughs> but um, so I thought... I, c I can make a spot welder. I can actually make a spot welder. And my thought was not only because of the potato masher, but was also um, because uh, you can then use the spot welder for all sorts of things, which is cases, I, I was thinking cases here, um, cases and repairs and all sorts of things. So um, so as, as we new normally do these days, we go to, the, we go to Dr. Google and <laughs> have a look. And I thought, Lots of people, um, there's lots of videos about people using microwave oven transformers, getting rid of the secondary, the high voltage secondary for the, the magnetron, um, and putting um, putting a few loops of, you know, decent gauge wire. We, we're talking sort of, you know, four and two gauge wire, so we're not talking insignificant amounts of copper here. Um, and coming up with a little frame and, and, and a lot of people are making these spot welders for LiPo batteries. So the 18650 batteries, um, they, they um, basically spot weld them together in the configuration they want for the particular battery pack. Um, and so there's lots of videos. And so I thought, okay, I can do this. I can, I can make one of these. Which, which I ended up making one of these and um, it didn't work. All it did was um, get hot, <laughs> get the material hot and not actually do anything. Now, in doing that, and I think I showed, um, I did get a transformer. I have a question from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Were you spot welding from the same side or from opposing sides? I don't, in, in the case of what I built, it was opposing sides. Oh, okay. It was opposing sides. So um, I, I wasn't actually doing the spot, the battery spot welded yep. stuff. Yep. I, I thought I can probably do that as a, as a sideline, but I, I, the need was to yep. <laughs> the need was to <laughs> fix. Um, and so um, I actually got a transformer from the resource tip shop, um, which someone I think had tried to use as a spot welding transformer. It had been rewound. Um, it had three um, reasonably decent uh, windings on the secondary. Uh, but just did not have the sort of power that you need to do spot welding with. So that was very rapidly put aside. Um, I, and it got the better of me, and I actually, I had a microwave transformer, and I cut the, in fact, I can show you, I can show you pictures of this. <laughs> um, so um, I actually cut, did, did the, the YouTube video, um, uh, somewhere here. Oh, that's the milk factory. <laughs> We've got the milk factory on the little screen. Um, but you can see um, here's the um, here's the the uh, close-up cam. Okay, let's zoom in here. That's the um, microwave transformer. And in fact, what we can do there it is up there for people who can see it. Um, that's the microwave transformer. It's got um, about a, a thousand watt primary winding, which is those wires at the bottom. And then there is, it, it comes out at about 2 kV at um, about 20 or 30 milliamps. So it's a bit scary um, <laughs> um, winding at the top. Um, so basically went through, um, you can see, here's me cutting the secondary off. You basically hacksaw the secondary off. Um, you don't try and unwind it because there's a couple of thousand turns on that. 
Hack, hack it off. Um, you can see there's there's that's all copper at the top, um, and there's copper windings. You bang the copper windings out, um, a la that. Um, so you just push them out, and you've got a decent amount of room to put a couple of turns of decent sized wire in there. And this is what most of the YouTube videos actually talk about. Um, and there you go. Um, so there's there's a, a big insulated hole. You've got your primary winding already there and you've got your secondary winding. Now I did all this, I put a clamp ammeter on the uh, primary winding, shorted the turn to see what it was actually capable of. Um, uh, that My clamp ammeter only goes to um, uh, 300 amps. Um, it was well and truly way over that on the secondary side. On the primary side, it only got to about five amps with a shorted turn on the output. And I went, uh, okay, this th because they talk about at least at least a kilowatt. Well, that's about a kilowatt. That's about a kilowatt. Yeah. So uh, so I then um, I did some. Uh, uh, oh, oh, and there you go. That's that's the couple of turns with. Wow. <laughs> um, and you you've seen I've written on twelve hundred fifty watts, <laughs> so I know what it's capable of. Um, so so um, and. Yeah, and there's now. There, I showed. I think I brought this in, didn't I? And I showed this clamp. This is a this is a clamp where you can clamp together and it actually locks. Um, now you'll see that there's a brass fitting um, that's got the bolt in it, and then there is a, a little copper um, spot welding <laughs> tip on it, which I actually bought. Now, who would like to have a guess at the conductivity? Of brass, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not as good as you'd like it to be. Well, if if copper is a hundred percent, say a hundred percent conductivity of copper, what do you think brass is in in a percentage? Is that it? No, no, at DC. Uh, well, sorry, AC. It's a fifty hertz. What do you think it is? Seventy percent. Keep going down. Fifty. Keep going down. Forty. Keep going down. Twenty. Twenty-eight. Really? Wow. It's 28%. So basically what you're looking at here is a wonderful current source with a couple of resistors. <laughs> and or the three, tip. 300 watts here. <laughs> and that. nothing. Well, not enough. Not enough. Put it that way. Not enough. So what I ended up doing, and, and that's that shows you. It looks nice though. It looks great. Mm. Brush is great. It conducts heat. It's great. Oh, I was thinking the other day, why don't we use brass to make antennas? I think you just answered the question. So what I end, oh, hang on, what I ended up doing <laughs> is replacing the brass with some copper strap, which I had in my scrap box, some copper earth um, bus bar, um, to make it look like that. So basically, it's copper all the way through, um, and. Um, made up some. Oh, oh, that's Mount Wellington. Um, <laughs> that's that's all there is in the uh, pictures. Um, so, um, um, so anyway, in doing that, um, I managed to um, then get enough current um, out of the twelve fifty. Now, what I then did. <laughs> Was I had another transformer because it it wasn't I, I, I didn't actually repair it using that microwave transformer because there wasn't enough oomph you know what I then did was I had a um I <laughs> had another transformer <laughs> um which um oh sorry um let's try that I had another transformer which was a much larger transformer um what gauge why is that again two gauge. It's about two gauge, yeah. It, it's it's double insulated. It is actually a welding lead. It's used on commercial welders. Um, it's a big transformer. I was going to think a bit, a bit of that um, copper pipe they use in air conditioning covered in heat shrink would do the same job. Oh, no, well and truly. Well, well and truly. Yeah. Bit bit harder to feed through and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I, what I did with this... It's really thin. It's only about a quarter inch. Oh, yeah? yeah? Okay. No, yeah. well, you'd be able to do that. And you'd yeah. be able to put a few more turns on there. You'd probably be able to use it to actually arc weld with. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> and destroy the mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, um, but the reason I used that was um, 
that lead, I specifically bought that lead, and it's actually not that expensive. I specifically bought that lead because it's it, it's heat resistant. Uh, it's actually made for welding lead. Um, so y y you don't melt through that outer very easily and a few other things, um, because if it gets too hot and it starts to then short those turns, uh, that's not what I want, because uh, you then have an awful lot more current all of a sudden. Um, so anyway, that's that's uh, I, I then moved. Oh no, that's me this morning. <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> that's a little four month old baby that I was holding. Um, uh, so this is the arrangement with the clamp, and that's what repaired this. So um, now when I put the clamp ammeter on the, um, you can see the clamp ammeters on the primary side of the transformer. Um, it's actually drawing somewhere between 15 and 20 amps. Ah. <laughs> so there's a couple of uh, there's circuit break is starting to trip. better start it's introducing some brass into the lab. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so my estimate on the primary on the secondary side is it's pretty close to a thousand amps. Um, right. So it gets that hot real quick, <laughs> um, which is exactly what you want. That's actually um, now most of spot welders have um, uh, spot welders have timing circuits on them. So you just you, you trigger them and they they <coughs> they fire off for x amount of of, of um, you know half a second or a tenth of a second or whatever. So anyway, so that that's an update on the um, spot welder. A, a worrying mm. comment from someone who just finished off a Yagi today mm. and used brass for the different element because it was easier to solder. <laughs> I, What's easier to solder than copper? Oh, well, I didn't have any copper, but it's easier to solder than. Alcohol. And as I said, I, I asked this I asked this question of Google last week. Why don't we build antennas out of brass? And I just couldn't find anything. Nobody builds antennas out of brass. Right. For any frequency, they just don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that the conductivity is an issue, and because it's a surface thing, isn't it? Correct. For RF. Yeah. Because you could probably use a piece of fencing wire. You'd have a problem soldering to it, but uh, I've galvanised it now, so I. But. Yeah. Um, Apparently, ga galvanised wire is not all good. Um, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, neither is stainless steel, from what I'm told. That's. Uh, well, they uh, make stainless steel antennas. For wire antennas, I mean. Oh, for wire antennas. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. sorry, you, you say stainless there, there steel is, is no is good a, for wire antennas. There is a. I mean, mean that there antenna is, there out there. That went into great detail to explain why stainless steel does not work on, on HF antennas. That one out there is. So, stainless steel wire for long. For HF that, antennas, that's is a bad idea from his, in his opinion. Yeah, okay. And, okay. He, and he substantiated it with a, re a relevant argument. I didn't bother yeah. to decide whether he was right or wrong. But uh, yeah, he, he made good points. Mm. Hang on, what have we got there? Well, where do you buy quarter inch uh, copper? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, quarter inch copper, if you find reasonable wire that's a reasonable conductor um, that would be in wiring. Um, and strip the insulation off, or leave the insulation on. That's probably where you get it from. Uh, no, and it's probably multi, strand. multi strand, tube. well and truly for copper tube. Copper tube, yeah. which you can buy from McCann's. Um, they sell copper tube because I've bought from them. Are you sure they sell copper? Yes. Oh, no, they sell I've copper tube. People use um, L yeah. LDF uh, 450, and they cut the center and use and that as a take the center as a, yeah, as a dipole. Probably. For two minutes wouldn't work. Um, but it's rigid, so no, for seventy centimeters, it's but two meters is a bit long. It sags too much. And and the problem is that's the problem with copper. It it's from a brass versus copper point of view, brass is less malleable mm. than copper. Copper will just bend. That's right. Yeah. So if a bird lands on it, it's just. <laughs> Mm. So, but you can buy you can buy the tube the copper tube from um, McCann's, and you could put something inside it like you've done with the the six mil elements the with the piano wire to give yeah, it some strength. strength. Put some aluminium through the through Dis dissimilar metal oh, yeah, issue. Oh yeah, no, actually, no, that's not there. Sand. 
Okay. Yeah. Same, same, same. Okay. There you go. Or even epoxy. epoxy so, um, it's fixed. <laughs> Have you actually mashed any potatoes? No, I haven't actually. No, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, 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 I haven't mashed any potatoes. It's been road potatoes. tested. <laughs> What's? It's probably broke again, but anyway. You, you, we've noticed that I actually, I, I, I did spot weld the other side as well, because I thought, <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen is that's not going to break, but the other side's going to break, but anyway. So yes, that's um, that's that's our uh, that's our update. Um, Can you take that out? Uh, yes. Well, that's good news. You've achieved that goal. <laughs> I, I, I have and, achieved uh, the goal. Mm -hmm. so I one evening we, we can now bring our, all our pots and pans in. Um, co uh, <laughs> correct. And um, I'm not sure that we'll, we might blow a circuit breaker here, but I've got to do some clean up on it. And um, yes, so, uh, but it's, it's a working device at this point. Thank you, Rex. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, uh, now let's. Um, now, what are we doing for time? Oh, it's 8.30 already. Okay. Um, just a reminder, um, there is, um, there's a couple of things that I'll ho hold over until next week. Um, there's a very f the fascinating article in IEEE about um, the tracking the movement of the Milky Way uh, with a DIY, DIY radio telescope, and it uses an SDR dongle. So I found it, uh, that was fascinating. Um, and there's a couple of others that I'll, I'll go into. Just a reminder, uh, Sisters Acousmatica, which is Pip and um, Julia, uh, are still uh, looking for their international open call for radio art. Um, so they're still looking for people to contribute, an artist to contribute um, uh, to their uh, community radio station, uh, which is being run out of their, their ute at the MAC, at the uh, Moon Art Centre, um, for the end of November into December. So they're looking for um, uh, uh, artists to come forward with things that they can actually play on their radio station. They've got a little low power um, FM radio station that they've got a license for. So um, uh, so they're looking for that. So uh, go to the Moon Art Centre and you'll see their, um, well they were, um, front, front page on the Moon Art Centre. Um, so it's good. Um, now our videos tonight. Um, our videos tonight. Um, and in fact, we've got the author of one of the videos, uh, the first video, <laughs> which is Ham Radio DX, um, and the video around the IC9700 drifting, even with the new firmware. <laughs> so there is. Uh, that's our first one. We've got three uh, very short videos after that of the Tonga uh, D expedition. Uh, which is Grant Willis and Group, uh, VK5GR. Uh, they were operating Alpha 35 Juliet Tango, uh, one on 160, one on 6 meter EME, and one on their 6 meter LFA antenna. Um, then we've got a fascinating one that I came across about the snow cruiser in Antarctica. Snow cruiser. That's called the Behemoth. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating, and um, it's believed to still be under the snow and ice in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. <coughs> was an abject failure, but um, <laughs> this was going to carry them to the South Pole and back. Um, mm -hmm. Huge, big wheel thing, just oh, okay. very interesting. But very Howard Hughes, if you know what I mean. Very Howard Hughes, who designed rather large an, uh, aircraft. Um, and then so there's the spruce goose of Antarctica. That's it. That's it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, then there is, um, if we get to it, a ham radio pile-up um, with a a, um, a Swedish a YL operator. So, which is a good a good video. Um, and then DX Commander with the interview with his daughter. So um, I, I don't know we'll get to that, but anyway, um, that's our videos for tonight. So I will open it up to our vast studio audience that's in the uh, studio at this particular point in time. So Warren, Hayden and Steve, <laughs> as to whether you've got any, any, any input for tonight's um, uh, ATV night. Any um, comments? Any comments? Oh, I might be able to offer three minutes or so. <coughs> um, grab the seat over here. And we'll 
head so across we'll to <coughs> there. No, we won't. We'll head across to there. <coughs> Why are we not doing that? Oh, there we go. There we go. Are we welcome, good? Warren. Yes, welcome. Well, this evening I had the pleasure of visiting um, Taruna High School. They had their annual um, STEM festival. Oh, okay. So uh, <coughs> there were lots of um, science, technology, engineering and mechanics, or whatever it's called. Yeah, engineering and maths. Uh, maths, yes, on display. <coughs> and uh, so uh, my son Joey is actually uh, on, on one of the projects okay, there. Okay. And uh, he's now in year 12 at Hobart College. Okay. But uh, this project he actually started when he was still uh, in but year 10 at Taruna. At, uh, at Taruna. Cool. And so uh, um, he, with a group of um, a few others, <coughs> yep. um, built a garden bed. Well, the actual garden bed itself was built by the, by the uh, wood workshop of the school. But they've built um, <coughs> a robot that will uh, maintain this garden. Okay. And so this, uh, this robot can um, um, actually uh, <coughs> um, move around above the bed. It can pick up seeds. It can plant the seeds into the soil. Okay. And then um, <coughs> it can go around, water the areas. Okay. And it can also do weeding. <coughs> wow. There's a camera for detecting weeding. Okay. <coughs> so it is still a, uh, what would you call it, a uh, a work in progress. A proof of concept? But um, <laughs> um, pretty much the um, uh, the mechanics is all working fine. Okay. Um, um, the, the code is, is all good. Okay. I think uh, what they still have to fine tune is just maybe um, um, uh, that the machine can self calibrate so that it knows okay. its starting position and things like that. There's okay. still a bit of tedious work involved in doing that. Okay. Oh well. Um, there were other things on display. Okay. Um, um, the uh, um, <coughs> um, robotic platforms that um, go around in competitions. Okay. Um, yep. Other science things that were interesting was a uh, um, a bed of sand that would have sort of uh, a um, uh, three-dimensional contour, if you like. Yep. Yeah. And um, this would be sensed by an Xbox. Um, um, Microsoft um, sensor, I forget what it's called now. But I know what you mean. It it, it, it position. It, um, it typically the kinetic one. Kinetic. Kinetic, that's yes, that's it. It's bomb. And um, <coughs> so what it does is that it sees the uh, 3D profile of the, of the surface of the sand, um, feeds that into a computer, the computer then displays an image from an overhead projector and this projector will then actually display contour lines around all the uh, okay. hills and troughs, so to speak. Yep. <coughs> and you can move it and it <coughs> moves accordingly. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I saw one of these down at PW1 at, um, during the science week, so on the, then the public day. That so was uh, fascinating. Um, there was lots to see, um, too much to take pictures of. Okay. Um, but I've got a few here that we can just uh, present. Cool, cool, cool. So, uh, <coughs> um, go to the start of all of this here. Um, I haven't filled it out the bad ones yet, but um, so, okay. Well, here's a picture <coughs> to show. Um, <coughs> we'll zoom out. Whoop, here. Oh, what we have here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Where were I'll we? Push I the think about. There, I think. Yep. <coughs> okay. So we, what, what we have here, this um, <coughs> this young lad, um, <coughs> a very simple setup, but he's got four pot plants, four pots which um, each have a plant in them, and um, <coughs> it has moisture sensors in the soil and automatic uh, watering, and um <coughs> the. Um, the sensors, interestingly enough, are capacitive sensors. Okay. Okay. So uh, there's no actually actual um, uh, electrical contact with some moisture yep. or with metal. It works with some yep. capacitance in, in, in the soil. In the soil. In, in the soil. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> the whole thing is um, controlled by an Arduino. Okay. And um, 
it uh, just maintains a, a constant moisture in, in, in the soil. Cool. Which um, I thought was pretty neat as a project. Definitely. <coughs> now, do you want me to keep um, going? Yeah, just... Uh, okay, until we get sort of a good image there. <coughs> uh, the, one of the science ones there here, Blue Tongue Lizard. <laughs> um, and this is our um, host guest <laughs> from Brazil, Rafael, who's staying with us temporarily. Cool. Um, keep on going. <coughs> Um, it was his chance to see uh, a blue tongue lizard and how how blue the tongue really is. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah, scroll through. Uh, we have a couple of these here. We might have a shot for one somewhere. Um, another of the robotics guys, he um, he built this crane. You and uh, the the um, controller part of the crane was um, the Lego Mindstorm yep. EV3. Yep. And visitors were able to uh, to drive it uh, using a essentially a handheld controller, which again was also an EV3, okay. and that talked via Bluetooth to the uh, to the, the EV3 one? that was in the crane. Cool. And uh, so kids had their fun um, <coughs> uh, playing with that. Um, <coughs> yeah, this is a um, there might be another one, a little bit sharper, and another one perhaps. Yeah, this is um, part of the uh, um, more serious robotics that uh, the university gets involved with. Okay. And they go to competitions um, around Australia. And uh, the latest competition was such that um, this machine needed to be able to um, <coughs> collect objects from uh, one area, carry them and set them okay. or deliver them to another area. Yep. Okay. And these were essentially... Uh, flat discs, um, there's a hole in the center, yep. and um, um, so how to pick these up, how to carry them, how not to lose them, and if they do fall down, how to pick them up and things like that. Okay, okay. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, yep, yeah, let's keep going. Um, this is the uh, the sand pit with the uh, <sighs> okay. connect sensor and the uh, projector up on top. Uh, and here we get to Joey's um, farm bot. <coughs> oh, come on. So, uh, uh, like I said, I've just arrived from Taruna, so I haven't actually filtered these photos yet. Um, <laughs> let's see, I just think it actually... Uh, oh, okay, goes that way, that's sorry. Let's see if we can find a... Yeah, this might be the best image for that. <coughs> So, yeah, this whole thing is about three meters long, maybe a meter and a bit or a meter and a half wide. Okay. And uh, we can see what looks like a bridge going across. Yep. So that whole bridge um, with the two pillars on each end can, um, can run uh, down the sides of the bed. So lengthwise, that's right. And uh, <coughs> along the, uh, the gantry, if you like, if there's a... Uh, Another mobile bit which can uh, then move um, along here. Yeah, <coughs> so perpendicular to that. And um, <coughs> what you can vaguely see are uh, <coughs> what looks like um, three little dishes on one side and three little dishes oh, yeah. on the other side. Yep. Those are little uh, contraptions that the uh, the robot can pick up. One of them contains uh, like a syringe needle okay. that is. Um, it's more like a draw needle, so it has a flat end to it, yeah. um, <coughs> and a vacuum system attached to it, and that will actually dip into a container that contains the seeds, pick a seed up, and then stick it into the soil. At the right depth. At the right depth. And then it moves back, puts it back, <coughs> gets the um, 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 a water nozzle, if you like, yep. and um, <coughs> Among the belt, which contains all the cabling, is also a tube um, that supplies water. So okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> uh, that's how it delivers water then uh, to the uh, okay. to the robot head, if you like, for what? watering the plants. What? Yes. So uh, <coughs> um, still some work to do on that, but um, um, once it's up and running, yeah, basically you can go away, and it's just um, it's slow. I mean. Uh, some people kind of think, well, I can plant seeds a lot quicker on my own. Um, yeah, and, and forget <coughs> to water them. 
Yeah. <laughs> Others might say, why use technology at all? We're losing, you know, touch with Earth. But the whole idea is, uh, is the uh, robotic um, learning experience mm. with this thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I mean, look, this thing can work happily all night long while you're asleep, Correct. all day long while you're at work. <laughs> Hey, um, you can put a light on it and it, it even have 24 hour light if you really wanted to but <laughs> you know yeah. actually to make it more attractive it had a strip of LEDs going along the top too that was sort of shining down okay but uh, yeah okay. good point yeah so I think um, I think that's about all I've got to show cool <coughs> cool cool so, so uh, fascinating and I have to say even if you don't have any f connections anymore to uh, Taruna High School it's certainly um a great event for the public. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't know it was on. Yeah, so. It's, uh, they don't advertise it very well, I mm. guess, um, um, mainly through their Facebook page. Really. Yeah, okay, okay. And maybe other STEM sources. And we and we've sort of um, we've sort of <laughs> oh, it's Alan. Okay, there's a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <coughs> good evening, uh, Alan VK Seven KHA. Uh, you're live in the TV studio at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Alan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How are you going? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Where are you? Have you a question? <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. Yes. Do you have a question to yeah. the uh, presentation? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, cool. Okay. So Venus, Venus, Mercury, and Jupiter, and the International Space Station. Wow. Well, there you go. And an ISS pass as well. I love it. Well, there you go. I love it. <laughs> well, we'll 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 uh, head outside after this and have a look. We'll duck outside shortly and have a look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. 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 Well, just um, <coughs> while you're there, um, hold on, Alan. I'll be with you in a second. Um, yeah. Well, that was Taruna High for today. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Warren. That's fantastic. And. Uh, pass on our congratulations to Joey. That's um, outrageous. Yes, no, it was a was a good event. Certainly, will do. Good stuff. And okay. catch you later, Alan. <laughs> All right. Any final comments? <laughs> we'll get underway with our uh, our uh, our videos. And uh, thanks to uh, all those people who uh, who uh, um, uh, are out there watching. I I will take a bit of a listen on uh, R two. We'll just go to our videos and take a listen on uh, R2 for anyone who would like to call in. And um, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll then head to our videos. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our uh, ATV experimenters night and 73. Does the ICOM 9700 still drift using ICOM's latest firmware? Well today in this video we're going to investigate that and uh, see whether ICOM has truly fixed this issue.